Professor Hollifield then brings us to Roll Jordan Roll, which my good friend Clyde Wilson told me as a political scientist. I'm just a poser here, by the way. I'm not a historian. I'm just a, a political scientist. Uh, he said, if you're going to read one book on, on slavery, read Roll Jordan Roll many years ago. And he said, also read the 123 pages of footnotes. And you consider that an education. What Professor Hollifield tells us is that in Roll Jordan Roll, the sort of Genovesian argument and explication of slave religion becomes important. It is, as Professor Hollifield suggests, a weapon of defense. And so that questions what the subtitle of that book should be, following Professor Hollifield's very erudite commentary, it should be Roll Jordan Roll Preachers Behaving Badly. Are preachers gone wild? Uh, which is kind of a scary prospect in itself. And also here we have the prominence of Thornwell, uh, probably the greatest theological mind uh, in the antebellum of the South, uh, comes into prominence. And uh, Professor Hollifield, I think, very adequately and thoughtfully and correctly puts that in the forefront. Um, I think also one of the most insightful things about Brooks's paper is that he says that it is in Roll Jordan Roll that we have the emergence of the biblical hermeneutic uh, that will, uh, Jean will, and Betsy will continue to explicate. And what is important about that hermeneutic is not so much as a, as a, as a sort of a, a biblical exegete, but it is becomes the basis of a certain view of order, a certain view of authority that will uh, predominate later works. He then brings us to the slaveholder's dilemma, 1992. Now, I think it is important to note, and Brooks doesn't do this, uh, but I'll do it, uh, that that book is dedicated to three scholars that Jean began to work with. One of them is here today, the man, the myth, legend, John Shelton Reed, my favorite sociologist. That's not a big pool of people to choose from, but we, you know, hey, uh, we love you. Um, my late friend Mel Bradford and my compatriot Clyde Wilson, with whom I work and continue to work with very closely. Uh, Professor Hollifield makes a tremendously insightful note of commentary when he says that in the slaveholder's dilemma, Genovese unites the freedom and progress tension within the southern mind with the institution of slavery. I would like to suggest and, and pose that in the slaveholder's dilemma we have even a greater breakthrough than uh, Professor Hollifield in, 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 in his credit and in his defense. And, a short version of a paper suggests. We have Genovese really surveying the tension within the South itself. Do, Calhoun, and then the advocates of slavery in the abstract. We have a diversity of thought uh, that Gene Genovese has opened us up to that has to be explicated. And then in Genovese's own words, we have Christian ethics and, and social society required some form of personal servitude as kind of a mantra of those three views, what they shared together, servitude and religion. And then we have the consuming fire, 1998, where I think Professor Hollifield correctly suggests we have the great death of, of the religious dimension of the slave system. We also have, I would say, go even further and suggest that we have Professor Genovese looking in a circumspect way on other challenging parts of social and political life in antebellum United States. In fact, discussing the immediatism of abolitionism. Um, and then ultimately looking at the critics of northern free, the free labor system and basing those criticisms with many as well as many others on scriptural bases. And of course we have then what is what will become the great trilogy. Um, the mind of the master class, the mind of the master class. And it, the sheer uh, um, collection of insight of those works. So I think these would be some questions and some issues I raise in terms of the fundamental text that Professor Hollifield has very thoughtfully and very uh, correctly summarized. And then I'd like to raise a few questions about uh, the interpretation of the Genovesian corpus. The first is about the notion of the dialectic itself. Now, as a Southern conservative, I don't find the dialectic all that appealing. Gene used that term early on. I wondered about the usefulness of that term. It's certainly not the platonic sense of the dialectic as an argument. There's no dialogical element uh, particularly explicit. And, and of course, Professor Hollifield 
raises these caveats. So my question is not really necessarily for you, Brooks, but in, in writ large, uh, it's certainly not a Kantian. There's no logic of illusions. Premises founded on so false assumptions that continue to resolve themselves. It's certainly not Hegelian uh, as it develops over time, but it's sort of the negation of the negation. What I would like to suggest is that the project may, instead of a dialectical mode of inquiry, maybe in, in many senses a kind of Burkean inquiry, resolving itself over time, the tension between reason and historical knowledge, and perhaps even revelation over time, resolving itself towards refinement. The second question that I would raise is uh, a, a feature that is not included as explicitly in, in Brooks's paper as, uh, as I suggest might be included, and that's the issue of faith, the combination of reason and faith, sort of like the name of the, the, the great encyclical a few years ago, the Dei Sed Ratio, the role of personal faith, the faith of Gene Genovese and his understanding and really <laughs> mastery of American uh, church history. The increased awareness and explication of the Orthodox Christian faith of the Southern. This is a great accomplishment. The text, the individuals, uh, is, a, is, a, is a work <laughs> and admission that deserves recognition. In, cons in, the consum in consuming fire, Genovese discusses, for example, the, the, the Southern clergy's prediction of a Confederate defeat, which uh, Brooks alludes to um, in, in a sort of different way than I'm suggesting. But they also argue for the against revolution, against dramatic change, preserving of a kind of conservative social and political order. The third issue I would raise for eventual discussion is, is perhaps beyond the pale of Brooks' paper, but the role of ecclesiastical and sort of sociology of religion issues in terms of the Genovesian project. For example, the role of scale, the role of place, and Brooks has touched upon these, but I think they're profound themes. And since they may be more important than simply the debate over scripture, and Genovese reminds us that. Brooks is right to mention Romans 13, obey the state, but on the other side you have Revelation 13. Hate the state. We live in what Plato called that matrix between the two, the tension. And that's precisely where Genovese asks us to come and to work and learn. The Bible, as that great social and political philosopher Louis Grizzard once said, the Bible's a big book and it's got a lot of ideas in it. It is a complex book and, and, and Brooks has given us an overview of that tension and the overview of that challenge. But part of that ecclesiological challenge is also to see beyond scripture but to the role of place, the role of scale. And this is what Genovese has allowed us to know and to see and to study. I'm reminded of that statement that is indicative of this attitude by John Randolph of Roanoke, one of the wild men of American history and politics. When John Randolph, no great, no great believer, no great saint, was asked, what is your world? John Randolph responded to his buddy, the old Richmond doctor, in this way. I was born and baptized in the Church of England. If I attend the convention at Charlottesville, which I rather doubt, I shall oppose myself then and always in every attempt at encroachment on the part of the church, the clergy especially, on the rights of conscience. I attribute in a very great degree my long estrangement from God to my abhorrence of prelactical pride and puritanical preciseness to ecclesiastical tyranny. Shall I fail to attend, it will arise from a repugnance to submit the religion of the church any more than the liberty of my country to foreign influence. When I speak of my country and my church, I speak of Virginia. The sense of place and scale is, and the reintroduction of those themes are one of the great achievements of the Genovese project. I offer these comments in a spirit of 
celebration of his life and work, which continues, and as I proposed, his canoniza future canonization, uh, and to the work of Brooks Hollifield, one of our outstanding church historians, and uh, probably taught me more than my own teachers, Brent Wacker and Russ Ritchie, but don't tell them that, Brooks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.